Hello and welcome to this NPTEL course of feminist writings. My name is Shikriti Shannal. I am a PhD scholar in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences of IIT Madras. Hello, my name is Mohit Sharma. I am a PhD scholar in Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Madras. In today's discussion, we are going to talk about feminism as a movement and criticism and theory. And we'll take a we'll take a feminist uh, text which uh, Dr. Paru has already taken up in class, and we'll discuss them at some length. Let us define feminism. Feminism is a movement, social, cultural, and political, which aims for the equality of sexes and which opposes discrimination on the basis of gender. We could also say that it is a critical tool or a framework through which we can analyze various discourses and see how discrimination operates through difference and how the underlying oppression of women is uh, highlighted and emphasized in different discourses yes. of the time. We can take the social, cultural, uh, political discourses as well as literature and popular media. Mm. Uh, and uh, we can talk about life in general and see how discrimination operates as uh, at various levels. And the text that we'll be discussing uh, highlight these uh, political aspects, the social aspect as well as the individual aspects right. in which uh, the gender is used as or uh, gender uh, is used as a tool for oppression. Yes, of course. And uh, so moving on, we can talk about uh, feminist movement a little in detail probably. Yeah. So there are three phases to the feminist movement. The first phase which is known as the suffrage movement is mostly about acquiring voting rights for women. Yeah, more, mainly the focus was on voting rights and uh, education which enabled the women to acquire a central character in the social and political sphere of their uh, uh, nation and their cultural uh, life. And acquire citizenship uh, yeah. uh, to a certain level. And then uh, we have uh, authors like Virginia Woolf or Simone de Beauvoir who extended this idea of the women's rights uh, from voting rights to also be in equal footing in the academic sphere or the workforce. Yes. And that, that paved the way for the second wave feminism. Yeah, uh, starting from the 1960s, uh, then we have this new train of thought where women come to understand that uh, the oppression lies at various levels, uh, not only in the basic rights. And when the voting rights were acquired, they became more conscious of the other multiple levels of oppression that were at work. And also uh, a lot of uh, the situation which uh, led to the rise of second wave uh, 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 was there because of the landscape uh, and the milieu of uh, Europe and America after the two world wars. Yes. The two world wars had led to a, a rapid decline in the workforce, the male workforce in the yes. industry and that led to a, uh, a introduction of women and a large number of women contributed to the economy of their countries right. and uh, they, they, they came to the forefront so they were say. also exposed to the yeah. uh, working atmosphere yeah. and they became more aware of their rights and they could uh, understand more, uh, uh, they could challenge more the oppression that was that, at play. Yeah, and with that liberty came the demand for sexual and uh, political rights. Uh, they began to see themselves as a political, as a sexual citizen. Right. Uh, and they saw that uh, they, they were even more aware of the uh, uh, of the oppression that uh, the social systems and the political systems prevalent were. Right. I think that uh, women basically challenged the stereotypes hmm. uh, that came with gender uh, roles, uh, that women were supposed to do certain work, like they were restricted to the domestic yeah. sphere, they were supposed to only take care of children yeah. and not participate in the outside world. Yeah. So that is the dichotomy that was created, right. that right. tension. Yeah. And uh, this question was taken up by Betty Friedan in The Feminine Mystique. And uh, she called this the problem with no name. And she says that uh, after World War II, uh, the American soldier and the male uh, who participated in the war, they return back and they expect uh, like women to be at home for them, to bear their children and to be the loving wife. This leads to the to women being stereotyped into that low, uh, into the role of a yes. wife and mother. And uh, Betty Friedan also says that uh, the women, they actually aspired to become the suburban housewife and that was a, yeah. an aspiration to them. And but then the question arises that when they were fulfilling their aspiration, why were they not happy? Yes, correct. And that, that led them to realize that uh, like uh, to, to completely uh, fulfill their roles as human individuals, they need to move uh, forward, move ahead beyond that uh, that uh, housewife role yes so they need need to appreciate themselves as an as an individual and have their own dreams and aspirations which were uh, thoroughly uh, submerged under the pressures of the patriarchal society which led to the development of feminist feminine consciousness and right. like the consolidation of identity 
and uh, like experience as like what uh, what constitutes a woman so to say i think this is a very important phase uh, in the second wave where uh, the category of woman came to be identified and uh, all the uh, women came to join that force and they came to identify the similar sets of problems or similar sets of experiences that all women have to undergo in their lives yeah. and they wanted to change that for Haan. themselves and a common and a common front was opened a political right. and a social front was opened around which to consolidate their own identity and their yeah. own issues issues and uh, it was uh, also uh, uh, explored in a lot of texts like i said uh, betty friedan's the feminine mystique another uh, text second sex was seminal in uh, creating such a friend right and second sex is more important uh, i think and uh, you can associate it with the uh, sentence that uh, Bouvard uses yes, yes. that one is not born but one becomes a woman becomes. Uh, i think it is a, a very important thing for for from during that time because she comes to dissociate gender from biological sex right. simon bouvard's work the second sex is very important because it distinguishes biological sex from gender and it talks about gender as constructed by uh, several discourses that operate around uh, in society Uh, another important feature of second wave uh, feminism is that uh, the uh, writers and the theorists in second wave feminism they started the initiative to rediscover women's writing i uh, so if we notice that uh, before this uh, phase in feminism uh, even in the academic circle all the texts that were taught and introduced were male dominated yes. texts so if you are a woman writer uh, your uh, you were not actually understood as someone of importance and your content content was criticized for being domestic and neither was your uh, voice uh, like uh, heard uh, you uniquely identified as a female voice who's uh, articulating the female consciousness and uh, that was the that was the project that uh, uh, writers and theorists like ellen show walter took up and uh, they what they uh, they try to articulate women's uh voices in uh, literature but and the one major aspect of this was project was to rediscover women's writing as mohi previously mentioned so uh female author texts were introduced in academia they were reprinted and circulated by uh, the virago press for example yeah. and uh, more and more female voices uh, started to be articulated and experiences started to be shared and they were uh, rediscovered as well in the 19th century a lot of uh, female writers who had previously been unknown uh they were discovered and yes they were found out to uh, articulate a unique experiences of being women which was which were probably ignored in the mainstream canonical writings of let's say uh jane austen or uh Uh, Charlotte Bronte and other uh, writers. Yeah. The idea is was to build a separate canon for women because right. in the male dominated canon, women were not uh, uh, allowed to. Uh, they did, she did not have a place, the female yeah. author. So it was important uh, to build a history of female writing, mm. which was the project taken up with Ellen Shawalter and other critics of her time. So uh, Shawalter. Uh, distinguishes uh, three phases yeah so yeah the three phases of uh, feminist writing yeah which is a uh, feminine feminist and the female phase so in the feminine phase uh, she says that uh, she uh, st uh, strives to uh, rediscover uh, uh, the writers who basically initiate the uh, uh, who initiate women's writing and who start by imitating the uh, the concerns the genres and the forms that uh, dominate male writing and right. then move on to feminist writings right and in the feminist phase the women uh, writers were seen as a reaction as a yes. reactionary to the uh, male stereotypical representation of women in their text uh, you could say that when we talk about the male dominated text the women were stereotypically represented as good and evil hmm. the binary between the virgin and the whore right. so they reacted to all these stereotypical representations of women and uh, so their writing can be seen as reactionary yes. and uh, it was certain is that protest and political yes and it was it uh, and it's from 1920 onwards that uh, uh, third phase which uh, show walter characterizes as the female phase starts in which she says that uh, from 1920 onwards especially in uh, works of writers such as virginia wolf and other modernist writers like dorothy richardson in which uh, like uh, uh, female writers start to uh, explore the concept of what it is to be a woman what it is to write as a woman and uh, what it is to experience the world around themselves as women 
so female feminist writing was no longer a response to uh, the patriarchal uh, writing or the male authors it had a voice of its own a structure of its own which brings us to the important concept of gyno criticism that was uh, theorized by ellen schwalter in gyno criticism ellen schwalter says that Uh, because women's writing is so different from men's writing and they address different issues than male authors there needs to be a separate tool mm. in or, uh, in order to critique that set of writing because the conventional tools are uh, only proper to appreciate male authors and male experiences they do not incorporate the female articulation and female experiences so she su- suggested that we should have a just as she suggested the need for a separate canon for women she suggested the need for a separate set of tools or tropes right, to appreciate right. female yeah. writing and she uh, she identifies that uh, uh, basic psychoanalytic or a textual uh, tool might not be enough or might might be very male oriented right to uh, rediscover female and the uh, feminine concerns right. in those writings right another is uh, like uh, towards the end uh, and uh, with the developed uh, uh, post structuralist perspective it was also identified that there were a lot of issues with second wave feminism primarily with the category with a universal category as woman yeah the category of woman as seen by second wave feminism is a monolithic, monolithic. fixed category which uh, primarily represents the white american uh, uh, or european middle yeah. class uh, upper class woman yeah and it excludes all other identities all other experiences of women for example black woman gender uh, lesbian woman and women uh, like uh, from different, different races regions, and different ethnicities. ethnicity yeah it articulates only the concerns and it uh, of the american woman and it couches them in a universalist language uh, which suppresses uh, the voices of other women yeah to take an example say the experience of a upper class manhattan woman cannot be the same as that of a, uh, a dalit woman in a, a rural area of india true right that led to the development of third wave feminism which was influenced with a lot of other theories uh, uh, building at around the same time like uh, uh, post colonial theory which articulated right. the issues of uh, uh, other uh, the colonized uh, nations and post structuralism which uh, also uh, identified a lot of issues in Uh, how we perceive texts yes and uh, in the third wave i think different voices or different experiences of feminism feminism came to understand the difference within itself and uh, it provided the space for different uh, voices to emerge and different uh, ethnicities and uh, people of different sexualities uh, came forward to represent themselves so the unified and consolidated idea of second wave feminism was diffused in the third wave where multiple identities and multiple uh, stories were made available mm. and it is in that third wave feminism that we see a lot of theorists coming out and a lot and uh, positing a lot of theories uh, which include uh, the experiences of those women okay. and uh, uh, it's it's very multifarious multi vocal right. and it uh, tries to uh, uh, integrate their experiences in what it means to be a woman which we later on analyze in a lot of our texts right so we understand third wave as a more inclusive uh, way of understanding uh, feminism right. which represents uh, or tries to represent the different categories of women uh, di- from different backgrounds where everybody can have a platform to discuss their point we'll start with the text uh, uh, the first text which we'll take up is the essay understanding patriarchy which again is an example of a seminal third wave feminism right. text we'll start with the essay understanding patriarchy by bell hooks and as the title indicates understanding patriarchy tries to understand patriarchy as a grand narrative which uh, in the words of bell hooks is the single most life threatening social disease assaulting the male body and spirit in our nation it also does a brilliant job of uh, deconstructing the binary between men as perpetrators of patriarchy and uh, women as victims right. uh, like we usually understand so when we talk about feminism it it is always um, women against men and she is the one who identifies that the major problem or the primary the root cause of the problem is patriarchy and not any particular biological sex yeah and uh, bell hooks goes uh, bell hooks uh, tries to understand how patriarchy suffuses all our uh, social and cultural institutions and right. uh, it is patriarchy which uh, uh, which 
perpetuates this violence uh, gendered violence both on the psychological and the physical level physical level and uh, so patriarchy comes as a grand narrative a predetermined given uh, so nobody questions it right. and she discusses patriarchy as a discourse that uh, is replicated in the institutions the socio cultural institutions and that we are taught to perform in different setups uh, and so that nobody can question its origin and it seems like natural yeah and and she goes on to and she goes on to analyze patri- how patriarchy operates as a natural given in the in the in our social institutions even the most natural ones like family and education and right. church right exactly so uh, maybe expanding a little or giving some examples we can talk about how patriarchy uh, operates in the family yeah. uh, okay and we don't understand it it's not given in the face we think that uh, it is uh, how it should be and how it and how it uh, shows and how it can be identified in uh, uh, in how we regulate children's behavior how we regulate exactly. children's play yes. which which is what we which is what we see in the uh, in the Exit essay as given by bell hooks when she talks about her own experience as a child in a midwest household where uh, like she plays with the marbles and her uh, brother plays with the marbles and which leads to a harrowing story of uh, uh, violence perpetrated right. gender violence and we can uh, have similar examples in our own fam- family settings where uh, boys are encouraged to play with cars or guns and uh, women uh, or little girl children are expected to play with uh toys yeah. like uh, dolls and uh, you know cooking ma- machinery which would uh, make them as potential uh, uh, household uh, yes right, right, right. right and boys are encouraged to go and play outside go right. get hurt it's better if you get hurt yeah. you get strong they are encouraged for more physical activity right, and right, women right. are encouraged to be passive uh, right. obedient uh, docile bodies which and is, individuals which, which is which is also what bell hooks uh, like uh, indicates in one of the uh, passages here that uh, a male uh, a male child is taught that his value consists in his ability to perpetrate controlled violence right and uh, it is uh, a, f- a female child's uh, uh, nature should be uh, the one to show emotions right. and the one to refrain from violence right. so we see that all these uh, all these uh, discourses of patriarchy are instilled into uh, instilled into people right from the very childhood right from the childhood even when uh, a child is born it starts with the name probably or even right, then right. if you are uh, born in a particular biological sex uh, uh, the entire script is uh, given to you that yes. uh, what kind of uh, positions are available for you to Uh, take up what kind of subjectivities you know starting from games to education to what kind of career choices everything is determined by the gender of the child and we see in the uh, example given by bell hooks how the particular event uh, that event of violence which was inflicted on the girl child uh, bell hooks herself as a child uh, like it becomes a psychological terrorism sort of which both disciplines a girl child in her own role and the boy child in her uh, in, in his, his own, own role. in his own role and the entire system operates through reward and punishment so yes. if you adhere to the roles that are prescribed by society you are rewarded uh, and if you are not you are penalized just like uh, in this uh, text bell hooks discusses her own experience and how she is penalized for uh, arguing with her father and insisting on playing the marble game so this is the this is the dual face of uh, a discourse right. a, a grand narrative so to Grand say narrative. which uh, which is naturalized through obedience but if you don't obey then you will be punished then you will uh, be punished either via violence or through uh, psychological violence like the shaming right and then uh, she brings a very important connection of ptsd the post traumatic stress disorder which we usually associate to post war uh, exposure True. and um, so she brings it in the family context and she says that these the punishments in the shape of punishments these scars that we receive uh, live with us for the rest of our lives right. they are not so easy to get rid of yeah and another incident that we see in uh, which uh, such a stress occurs at the level of childhood is when uh, uh, when uh, terence uh, real uh, shows us the example in which a boy which likes to dress up as a girl is shamed instantly shamed by his uh, playmates and even that leaves a scar on the boy child right and it is through these examples that we get to see that uh, trauma is a thing which uh, which doesn't act only in the field of war or in the field. right trauma can be domesticized yes, as well right. and uh, the, and we can also see uh, mohit very interestingly that 
patriarchy is something that does not only restrict the girl child or affect the girl child it affects the boy child also like the example that you just took uh, here the boy child who is trying to dress as a woman uh, uh, is not again not appreciated or not rewarded or rather punished or laughed at so it shows that patriarchy expects each gender to stick to their own roles hmm. and not exceed them or challenge them in any way yeah it is here that we see how uh, patriarchy as a ideology as a grand narrative affects both men and women in the same way because yes. uh, by making by uh, ins- by instituting uh, men as perpetrators it is also installing men as victims in their own category because it stunts their emotional development yes it, and they are not able to achieve the uh, emotional wholeness or empathy true. because they see life uh, through this frame of violence through and uh, through their masculinity uh, which needs to be asserted at all levels every time they are forced to behave in that uh, violent aggressive fashion yeah which is which is which is why he she describes uh, patriarchy as a social uh, as a social disease yes because it makes emotional cripple out of men it and it inflicts both men and women with trauma uh, during childhood which they are uh, which they have to carry or which they find very difficult to overcome find very difficult to overcome till very late in their adulthood right and it shapes the way we see ourselves and uh, ourselves as human beings and shapes the way in which our future uh, entails Uh, one very important uh, way in which patriarchy insinuates in itself as a grand narrative in people's mind and in society is by uh, by disguising itself because if you go and ask uh, people why do you think what is the problem uh, in the gender discrimination people will say it's violence gender violence sex violence and the sexual assaults on women people uh, usually do not identify patriarchy Uh, as, as a male ide- problem as a male problem as a problem which is at the root of these issues yes because they mostly we see men as perpetrators of violence yeah. and uh, women as victims yeah and it is only the external face of violence which is visible right but so most of the people uh, are uh, like used to see patriarchy as a beneficial uh, beneficial to for, society in general yes. and uh, especially for the men they feel that uh, patriarchy is beneficiary to them because they obviously enjoy a certain degree of power and privilege in society right, right. but what they don't understand or what is not apparent uh, is that uh, how it is like a disease uh, is um, it, it it makes them emotional cripples and it uh, it it also dehumanizes them right uh, in making them perpetrators it and make, also makes them, them behave in a certain way uh, that does not let them achieve their full capacity as a human being like right. a rational and, and emotional human being and and it's not only it's not only men who are uh, who think that patriarchy is beneficial but like women are also equally prone to uh, fall into this belief that it is not patriarchy as such which is at the root of these issues and belux takes up this thing and uh, like she uh, points out to the fact that it is not uh, it is not uh, only uh, homes with mother and father uh, which uh, which has this patriarchal model of obedience right. and domination even it, in uh, families with single parents like a single mother we see the same patriarchal setup because uh, we have this idea of the absent father even when the father is not there the mother uh, has to behave as like the father or she follows the same protocols yeah. that a male uh, uh, entity would yeah and the absent father becomes an idealized figure which right. is to be revered and which is to be yes. uh, followed then followed then so uh, till this point whatever we have discussed we have seen that uh, when we talk about feminist uh, theory or movement so it is not a fight between the sexes right. or the genders it is actually a fight against patriarchy with both the sexes should come together and fight there is that anti male feminists uh, when they uh, when they are fighting against males and they are fighting against male oppression are basically couching their own desire for power right and they are replacing one system of power with another system of right. power they are not really uh, deconstructing the binary and they are not really deconstructing that it is the binary the, which uh, which uh, both which causes uh, uh, which we need to do away yeah which, which uh, in because of which the issues uh, that men face men also face right. are not able uh, are not resolved right so the uh patriarchy as a problem to men is a very new and novel idea that uh, bell hooks proposes because before this uh, uh, as we previously discussed that uh, patriarchy was understood as a problem primarily of women but since hence forward uh, uh, hence forth uh, through bell hooks essay we can understand then how it is it affects both the genders right right and uh, 
uh, another thing that bell hooks uh, points out in the in this essay in fact uh, uh, she uh, reveals it uh, through the way she structures the narrative is that uh, pet, uh, is the uh, is that gender relations and patriarchy is uh, something which needs to be understood both on the experiential and the textual level because uh, often times we uh, textualize these differences the binaries yes, yes. of oppression and right. this and we do and not we do not the, uh, we do not give enough stress to the everyday lived experiences right, of patriarchy right. and uh, which can be more complex than the those binaries indicate exactly uh, so uh, we can see at different levels how uh, patriarchy works in order to oppress women right. say uh, whether it be the objectification of the uh, female body or the creation of uh, docile uh, passive uh, women and uh, uh, women with passive sexuality yeah. so uh, just like women are given these very passive roles to uh, adhere to men are just given the opposite uh, yeah. and the idea of a passive male or a peaceful male so to say is strongly opposed by such yes. a narrative right. and a, a man which is a peaceful passive uh, male is a is shamed or is a forced to change uh, his way of uh, uh, living uh, in such a case right. which we see in the uh, the example that she gives of her own partner right and then so we see that uh, patriarchy promotes a certain kind of lifestyle in men uh, through this uh, macho masculine uh, exhibition yeah. where uh, it is um, makes men prone to addiction and uh, violence and uh, yeah. trauma of all uh, different sorts of levels so uh, bell hooks asks that if patriarchy is so beneficial to men how come they are constantly prone to trauma depression and uh, addiction yeah right which is where the experiential uh, part of the picture exactly. comes in so one important point uh, important uh, point that bell hooks points out is that uh, uh, it's a it's a complex relationship between experientiality and uh, textuality that uh, uh, men are perpetrators as well as victims yes and uh, so we can through this understanding of uh, patriarchy that uh, bell hooks proposes we can identify then patriarchy as a performance uh, right. which uh, you know which we reproduce in different contexts different socio cultural contexts context, uh, differently but uh, it is something that uh, is not voluntary of the human being or the individual it is something that is proposed by uh, the society and uh, that is uh, that is basically a discourse and that is performed by the individuals and another aspect of patriarchy which is often disguised is how it replicates itself uh, in the case of uh, bellhop's partner uh, he ultimately uh, becomes the same person that he doesn't want to be right. or somebody that he uh, opposes right uh, and it is it is this is the way how patriarchy replicates and perpetuates itself Yes. Well, another important aspect of uh, patriarchy perpetrating itself and replicating itself is through the process of embodiment, mm. uh, which Dr. Pari has discussed in detail. That yeah. uh, you know, because when we try to understand a certain set of or follow a certain set of norms, we come to live it, and it is. Uh, experienced uh, by us and it is reproduced through us uh, in the way we dress in the way we talk in the, in the way, way we play. play exactly in the in the entire way we conduct ourselves right right as human beings so we can see how patriarchy operates as very intricate levels and not always on very apparent levels like uh, male violence uh, yeah. over women but also very in a family context in the context of the most intimate spaces and uh, spaces where we feel the more uh, most comfortable and uh, protective yeah which is which is why uh, uh, bell hooks uh, stresses uh, at the end that uh, while countering uh, anti male activist which is why at the end bell hooks points out that uh, uh, while opposing anti male uh, feminists that we need to work with male we need to work with men and understand their problems in un in understanding how patriarchy works in yes. deconstructing its premises right try to uh, remove it right so one model of domination cannot be replaced with another model of domination right. so uh, then what we are looking forward to is a society without patriarchy where men and women both can op a function at equal footing and uh, where patriarchy does not uh, destroy the empathetic and uh, uh, human right. human relationship uh, that can exist in a society right, right. through violence and uh, perversion so in this session uh, we've covered uh, feminism the evolution of feminist thought 
and we covered the essay bell, uh, understanding patriarchy, patriarchy by bell hooks by bell hooks where we came to understand the term uh, or analyze the term patriarchy in great detail right. and how it operates in multiple layers of uh, society as well as uh, culture and politics thank you